So when the world says, who are we? What are we expressing? What are we reflecting? Eckhart Tolle, in his book, The Power of Now, that powerful book that linked with Oprah, millions of people were exposed to that idea. Eckhart Tolle began telling his story that for almost the first 30 years of his life, he spent the first 30 years of his life in anguish, angry, depressed. He uses the word self-loathing. That he hated life, but above all, he hated his own life, and he wanted to die. And the desire to die in him was much greater than the desire to live. And on this particular night, when he was contemplating taking his life, he said these words kept going around and around and around in his head. He kept thinking, I cannot live with myself any longer. I cannot live with myself any longer. Over and over and over. Until all of a sudden a thought occurred. Are there two of me or one? Who is I and who is the me that I cannot live with? And in that moment, something shifted in him. He said, it says, if the air went out of a balloon and the me that he knew himself to be, the everything that he had, when life said, who are you? The him that he had projected all of a sudden was deflated. And the immortal, eternal, the I am of him manifest in such a degree that it changed his life. His I am became bigger than anything he attached that to. It's easy for us to get confused. Do you ever get caught up in your circumstances and when things happen we think that that defines or somehow limits us? Yeah. There was a Sunday in church where Linda brought her grandson to, ch to church. And her grandson was one of those that liked to squirm and wiggle and talk. And so it was time for meditation. And Linda said, honey, you, you've got to sit down and be quiet. And after much wrestling with him, he finally sat down. But he said out loud, okay, grandma, I'm going to sit down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Sherry, you probably know that, Linda, from Lawrence. Right in the middle of service, said it loudly for everyone to hear. You can make me sit down on the outside, but I'm still standing up on the inside. I thought, what a paradox, for a, a great analogy for life when every day we're being asked, can we disentangle who we really are with the circumstances of our life? Because each and every one of us, in many ways, encounter situations or individuals, circumstances that require us to in some way sit down or feel physically frustrated or compromised or perhaps something we had hoped all of a sudden is gone. And in some way, we're having to sit down in our world. Yet can we connect with the truth, our true I am, that part of us that exists irrespective of any circumstance or any condition that is always standing strong, available for us to draw from that as our identity and therefore our source of love, of peace, of whatever it is that we may need. In my own life, when I was graduating from, getting ready to graduate from seminary, when you graduate from the program and you're going to apply for your, church, your first church, you're strongly encouraged to apply to at least three different churches. And it makes sense because that would give you an opportunity to explore three different possibilities and to see what you really resonate with. Well, that was a great theory, but for me, I was clearly only drawn to one place. And I would talk to different classmates and they'd say, yeah, but you know, you need to apply for more than one place. And I kept thinking, but there's nowhere else I'm interested. I'm clearly only drawn to one place. And what soon began to happen, so I was only applying for that one place. I was excited. I felt very clear about that until I found out a number of my classmates were also applying for that same place. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I began to think, oh... And I moved into that feeling of, you know, am I good enough? What if they get selected instead of me? Or maybe I should, should not? Or, you know, all those things started going around and around and around in my head. And during that time of 
me trying to stay centered and, and really remember that it's not about them, it's about me, a letter came from home, really it was a card, from a friend. And in the course of this the little note in the card, the person said, I just felt to remind you that life is not shaped by the circumstances around you. That your life is always shaped by the vision that you hold. And I thought, wow, what profound wisdom in a time that I needed it, that my life was not going to be shaped by whatever was available or not available around me. My life was not shaped by those times that I felt like I had to sit down and in some way compromise. But my life was shaped by the vision that I could hold and behold. And first and foremost, that is the vision that I held of the God of my being and the vision that I held of myself. And after reading that, I was able to just let go and not be so attached. I didn't have my, my persona, my personality, my ego so tangled up in it. I truly was able to say, you know what, if this is for me, then I, I want it. And so I'm going for it. But if it's not, I'm going to be okay. And I'll know that it's a stepping stone along my path. And things unfolded beautifully. And as it happened, that was the place I was guided to be. But I can tell you that even if I weren't, that I would have been fine because I knew that I knew that I knew that however that played out, it did not in any way diminish the truth that I was on my path, that I was connected to my source, and that my gifts and my talent would have an avenue to express themselves through me. Yes? Yeah. Cerny, can I have that last song? One of the most powerful teachings that came back to me about who we are and how life is always asking us, who are we? happened during my, my first few years of ministry. In Lawrence, Kansas, there's a university and a young man was, one of the college students, was killed in a motorcycle accident. And his girlfriend one day was walking by the church and she said it felt like she just got pulled in. And she came in and I was there and she sat down and talked and cried and cried. And what happened after that is a lot of her friends, so we had a bunch of college students that overnight started coming to church. And not only were they a bunch of college students, but a bunch of international college students started coming. And every week I would, you know, say hello and, and meet these beautiful young people. And I noticed this young girl, uh, she told me her name, and she was from Korea, and that's about all I know. She didn't speak a lot of English, but she came through the line every week. And then one week she said, can I meet with you? And I was surprised. And so she did. I thought she was sort of just coming with her friends, but she came to the church, and she said, can I tell you my story? Now I have her permission to tell you her story because she told the whole church this later. Her name is Eunice Lee. Eunice Lee was born into a family in Korea and soon after she was born, her parents divorced. Now at that time in that culture, that was horrible. Because for a mother who had a child and was unwed, she was marked for the rest of her life. And for a father who had a wife that was still living and left him, he was a shame and disgrace. And that child was evidence that each of these parents had failed. And so each of these parents did their best to get rid of this child. So this child told the story of, from her earliest memories of being with the mother's family and being taken across the village to the father's house and left on the doorsteps. And then as soon as the father's family found the child, they didn't want to be associated. They would gather up the child and go back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Eunice said, I can remember when I was five years old, I screamed and said, will you just take me to an orphanage? And she said, at which time they did. And before they could leave the orphanage, the people in the orphanage ran back out with her and said, you are living parents, you cannot leave her here. And she went on to tell more stuff about her life and I sat there with tears streaming down my face. And the most shocking thing was when she said, and I want to tell you Reverend Darlene, that when I started coming here, I came because my friends came. She said, I didn't know I had a soul. <laughs> 